Howdy everyone. So what we'll do right now is we'll finish up our discussion about scale for subsurface modeling. We'll get into some really practical types of methods to be able to at least do something to deal with the different scales that we're working with. Of course, I'm not going to present a panacea solution, but, but something to kind of help us out a bit. So, in general, in the last lecture, we introduced the idea that we can calculate dispersion variance. We talked about how it's very similar to a variance that we know and love. In fact, the variance we're used to is a very general form of dispersion variance where we're dealing with the data native scale within the area of interest. Well, now with a more general concept of dispersion variance, we can deal with any arbitrary volume, any size, and we can calculate these amount of variability with the, of volume little v within big V would be the dispersion variance little v big V. Now, given a positive definite variogram model and volumes little v and big V, we can calculate the dispersion variance directly from gamma bar values. That is super cool. And that's the reason we introduced the concept of gamma bar. You recall in the last lecture, we talked about the idea of being able to do a volume integrated calculation of gamma bar. In this, we were basically just integrating the tail of the lag vector and the head of the lag vector over the two volumes and calculating the variogram that resulted as we integrated the positive definite variogram model over the two volumes. Now, if we looked at a dispersion variance between little v and big V, we can calculate it by calculating the gamma bar big V big V and subtracting the gamma bar little v little v. Now, of course, the C-bar values, we showed previously that a gamma bar value can be equated to a C-bar value or the co volume integrated covariance function just by taking the C-bar is equal to the SIL minus the gamma bar. If you do a substitution right here, you'll see that it just does a switch. That if you want to work with C-bar values, the dispersion variance little v big V is simply going to be the C bar little v little v minus the C bar big V big V. That's a very powerful tool because now we can predict analytically what's going to be the amount of variability between these two volumes. And we do it all with our spatial continuity model, the variogram that we've already calculated. We modeled it in a positive, definite manner. We're good to go. Now let's talk a little bit about it. This is kind of interesting. The variance of a quasi point support data or, or a native data support within model cell can be calculated as the following. This would be the dispersion variance of the point within the little v volume. Well, the little v volume here is representing the model cell. And if we look at that calculation, what it should be is the gamma bar little v little v minus the gamma bar point point. But guess what? The gamma bar point point, technically, if the data is at a very small scale, quasi point support scale, what is the variogram at zero lag offset? Well, it should be zero. It will be zero at exactly. So if you're working effectively at point scale, gamma bar point point will go to zero. And so we can get the amount of variability within model cell just simply by calculating the gamma bar little v little v. The expected level of ergodic fluctuations can be calculated using gamma bar too, because now we're modeling with a model with a big V volume. That's the entire model that we're working with, but we're modeling it within a statistical framework that assumes an infinite domain, a, an unlimited or unconstrained domain. And so we can calculate the amount of statistical fluctuations or ergodic fluctuations in our statistics in our model as the dispersion variance big V, the size of our model, within infinity. Now, this would be gamma bar infinity infinity. But of course, if our variogram is modeled to the SIL in infinity, we would imagine that that integration would just result in the SIL, the variance. And we subtract from it the gamma bar big V big V, and that will get us the expected level of ergodic fluctuations. Of course, data conditioning can have an additional constraint on ergodic fluctuations and may further constrain it. But this would provide you an 
an upper bound of what you would expect for ergodic fluctuations. Now, this is a very powerful concept right here. We talked previously about the additivity of variance and we took advantage of it in order to be able to move from the total variability to partition variance into a known trend and an unknown residual. So now what we can do is we can talk about additivity of variance with regard to dispersion variances in a more general sense. Okay, the dispersion variance at points within big V is equal to the dispersion variance of little points within an intermediate volume, little v, plus the dispersion variance of the little v, that same intermediate volume, within the big V volume. This is really, really powerful. In fact, one way to think about it is this. This is the total variability of the phenomenon in space. This is the amount of variability of the phenomenon or property within a model cell. This is the amount of variability of the model cells within the model. That is a very powerful concept. And so what do we learn from that? As we make our model cells larger, more of the variabilities tucked into the model cell, less is expressed between the model cells, but there's a conservation of that variance overall, that dispersion variance. What we take away and hide within the cell, now we're going to have less variability between the model cells. And so there's partitioning of variance between what's inside the cell and what's between the cells. This relationship is known as Krieg's relation. Now, it's not at all hard to solve for. In fact, if we just take the dispersion variance definition of little of point little v, dispersion variance of little v big v, expand them and simply add the two systems together, you'll find very quickly that it will simplify down to be this relationship. We get Krieg's relation. So the proof is super easy. What are we going to do with it? Well, we know a little bit of the algebra of working with dispersion variances now, and we can get to something very powerful. The F factor is a variance reduction factor that you would expect as you were to upscale or change the scale. What it is, it's a ratio of how much variability you see at the model cell or the scale that we're working at, little v, within the model area, big V, over the total amount of variability you saw in the original data set at the native data scale point support scale. So this is a variance reduction factor. When I go from the data to a model cell, how much should I reduce the variance? Well, we want to solve for that. Super easy to do. Let's do a couple of substitutions. First of all, we can take the dispersion variance of little v, big v, and we can substitute into it from using Krieg's relationship, the dispersion variance of point to big v minus the dispersion variance of point to little v. Then what we can do is that we can, of course, take the common denominators, we get a one minus the dispersion variance of point little v over the dispersion variance of point big v. And we'll recall from the definition of dispersion variance that we showed just a couple slides back that this right here, the dispersion variance of point little v is in fact just equal to the gamma bar little v little v. And the dispersion variance of point within the entire volume is in fact the original sample variance, the representative sample variance that we're working with. Well, this is super powerful. All we have to do is calculate the gamma bar little v little v based on the cell size that we're working with, knowing the Veragram model that's already been calculated, and we have a variance reduction factor that we can apply in order to scale our data. How are we gonna scale the data? Super easy to do. Now, I mentioned before, we're not going to assume any shape change in the distribution. We can just assume a change in the variance. We're taking the original distribution and squeezing it as we scale up. We can move from native data support size to the subsurface property distribution within the model scale by applying the affine correction. Now, if you look at this, this is kind of interesting. We're basically doing a quantile to quantile transformation. Literally, the Q is going to be the original value from the original distribution. The Q prime is the new value. The mean has not changed, so we'll just use the same mean. We have to remove the mean first to center it. Then we can do the squeeze. Then we add the mean back in to 
put it back where it should be so we don't create a bias. Now all we have to do is apply a factor, an F factor. Now the F factor is a scaling factor that should reduce it. We have to do the square root because if you recall from expectation in original statistics lectures from the undergrad course, you'll note that if you take a coefficient, apply it to the random variable, and you take its variance, we can actually show that it becomes a square of that. So if we want to apply a factor and get a scaling, a square root of it, or we would create a bias. All right, so we can take our distribution, we can calculate the F, the scale-based variance reduction factor. We can now apply it to each one of the data values as a quantile transform. And then we can go ahead and get a new distribution. Now, people will ask, are you applying this to the actual data values? No, we're applying this to the values that are within the distribution. We're not actually changing the data values at the data locations. We're changing the reference distribution that we try to honor with simulation. If you want to change the values at the data locations, you would have to do effective property upscaling around the well based on some type of model of heterogeneity around the well, right? And so we're not actually suggesting that here. We're suggesting how to correct the statistic, the distribution, not the conditioning data for the model. Okay, what's the limitations? Well, there's going to be an arbitrary minimum and maximum anytime you stretch or squeeze a distribution. You know the variance should be corrected, but we're not using any shape change. It could result in some unrealistic values. Specifically, if you try to use this for downscaling, you could end up with negative porosity very easily. It could result in unrealistic distributions. The log normal distribution scaled up, in fact, does not, it does have a shape change. It does become more symmetric as it's being scaled up. It doesn't remain with the same shape, just squeezed together. And so really, um, experts would say a practical limit of about, if you're doing a upscaling, of about 0.7, anything beyond that, it's too much change in the distribution. You should be thinking about some type of shape change too. All right, so this was a general lecture set about scale for subsurface modeling. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the, the, there's a lot of problems. It's not completely solved. We try to address this. The missing scale is still commonly missing. There's a lot of research in this topic, but for the purpose of this course and the level that we need to be able to get started in subsurface modeling, I hope that this was sufficient and understandable. All right, I hope this was interesting to folks. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the Geostats guy on Twitter, YouTube, and GitHub. And I welcome any questions or comments anytime. I'm always happy to discuss. All right. All right. Take care, guys.